break. That wasn't a long break. That's not the break. <laughs> the actual break is later. I'd like to have everyone back here for the next session. This is not yet the coffee break. The coffee break will be later. <laughs> so, in order to give attention, enough attention to the next session, and uh, we have more time also, we have a bit longer time then. Okay, I'm pleased to introduce uh, the special session here in the plenary lecture because it is uh, the paper with the best paper award. Um, it is about uh, identification protocols and signature schemes based on uh, super singular isogeny problems. Uh, Stephen Galbraith, Christoph Petit and Javier Silva are the authors and Javier, uh, please. Uh. Okay, thanks. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, this is that of the paper, identification protocols and signature scheme based on super singular isogeny problems. So, uh, I have two goals for this talk. First, that you understand what the title means. And second, to give you a very brief um, intuition of our construction and, uh, and why it works. So, uh, as Dustin has just said in the previous talk, uh, most of cryptography relies on uh, diffie hellman type problem or RSA assumptions, which essentially, in the end, uh, depend on two problems, discrete log and factorization. And when we consider quantum algorithms, uh, these problems are broken, so we start to look for alternatives. Um, one alternative, one of the minority alternatives, uh, is the uh, elliptic curve isogenies. So we will see what we can build with them. So to give you a little bit of perspective, uh, I want to recall what has been done in the isogeny based crypto in the recent years. So we have uh, hash functions, uh, key exchange protocols, the signature verified signatures, public key encryption, ID protocols, the number of signatures, signatures, a lot of stuff. Uh, in particular, we already have ID protocols and signatures, and we're building a new ones. So why? Uh, the answer is that uh, so the signature scheme that already exists actually relies on the ID protocol that already exists, and they share the same issue, and it is that uh, they rely not on the pure uh, isogeny problem, but uh, on a modified problem that gives uh, some extra information to the attacker. So uh, this is a potentially uh, an easier problem. So what we are trying to achieve uh, in our paper is to build uh, ID schemes and then signatures uh, rely on the, on the pure problem without giving any extra information. Um, okay. So the outline of this talk is the following. First, I will recall uh, the graph isomorphism proof. Uh, I believe most of you will be familiar with it, but uh, it's worth recalling because uh, it will share a common structure with, uh, with the proof we are going to build. Uh, then I will talk about uh, the super singular isogeny graph, which is one of our main tools for building this uh, identification protocol. Then uh, I will explain the construction very briefly and talk about how we can get signatures from that. So, graph isomorphism first, uh, this is a textbook example of a zero knowledge proof. Uh, so, we have two parties, Peggy and Vic, and Peggy is the prover uh, that knows a secret and wants to prove to Vic, the verifier, that knows the secret uh, without revealing any information about it. So, in this case, the secret is an isogeny between, uh, uh, sorry, not the isogeny yet, an isomorphism. <laughs> Uh, between two graphs. Uh, so I will represent on the left part of the screen uh, what Peggy knows and on the right part of the screen but what Big knows. So uh, the difference right now is that Peggy knows the secret, this, iso this isomorphism, uh, and Big doesn't. So how does the protocol work? Well, first Peggy takes a, a random permutation of the graph G1 and produces another graph G2 and sends this graph to Big uh, but without sending the permutation. So now we sends a challenge, which is just one bit, either zero or one. Uh, I'm going to use uh, the red color to represent what happens when the bit is zero, and blue, what happens when the bit is one. Uh, so when the bit is zero, uh, Peggy just reveals uh, this vertical isomorphism. And in the other case, reveals an isomorphism between G0 and G2, with this just the composition of these two. Uh, so very intuitively, uh, why is this secure? First, uh, can Peggy cheat? Uh, well, on a very high level, what happens is that uh, the, the only thing Peggy can do if she doesn't know the this secret isomorphism and wants to 
uh, to produce a proof is to guess which, uh, which sand, either 0 or 1, is the bit going to send. Uh, so either she takes a random permutation from here or from here. Uh, so she can cheat with probability one half. To solve this, uh, we just repeat the protocol many times uh, to make this, uh, this cheating probability negligible. Uh, and what about the other property? We want this uh, interaction to reveal nothing about the secret. Uh, and intuitively, uh, that happens because uh, when the bit is zero, we're just revealing this vertical uh, isomorphism, which is, which is independent from the secret. And in the other case, we're revealing the composition and this part is uh, essentially masking this one. So we have the, the zero knowledge pro uh, property. Uh, so after that, we have built a, an identification scheme, and there's a standard way to make a, to produce a signature scheme from that. Uh, there's uh, some general transformations. Uh, traditionally, it's the most very well-known one is Fias Shamir. Uh, we can use it to produce signatures from identification schemes. Uh, so. This, uh, this protocol that I just presented uh, has a structure in which we move uh, between a few graphs. But actually we can think of a very similar structure within uh, one graph, which is we take uh, as vertices, uh, we take the vertices of a graph and we have a path between them that is secret and we will assume it is hard to compute. And uh, we, re we replicate the same structure. Given a, a challenge, we either give uh, this path the vertical one, or the path from E0 to E2. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is, uh, what is this graph, and uh, why is this uh, secret hard to compute? So that's where uh, the, the super singular isogeny is coming into play. So uh, to introduce the super singular isogeny graph, uh, I first need to introduce um, very, few, very few simple definitions of uh, elliptic curve theory. Uh, so elliptic curve, I, I believe we all know what it is. Uh, it's just an algebraic curve with a graph structure. We, we can essentially add two points by using this rule. And an isogeny is essentially a function between two elliptic curves. And an endomorphism is uh, an isogeny from a curve to itself. So we have this structure in which we have uh, two points and we have a, an arrow between them and we want this arrow to be hard to compute. So the natural problem we, we come up here with is the, the isogeny problem. We have uh, two isogenous elliptic curves, and we want to compute an, uh, the isogeny between them. And this is believed to be hard. And a related problem is, uh, given an elliptic curve, compute the endomorphism range. Uh, but the thing is, uh, not for any curves uh, are these problems of the same level of hardness. Uh, actually, there's a classification uh, of, the, of elliptic curves. I, want to get, I won't get into the details of that, but uh, essentially there are two types of elliptic curves, either ordinary or super singular. And uh, we can solve these problems differently for each of these types, and it turns out that they're harder to solve for a uh, super singular elliptic curve. Actually, these two problems uh, in this case are uh, equivalent. They're not known to be equivalent uh, for ordinary curves, and we have complexities uh, of the order of p1 half uh, classically and p1 fourth quantumly, uh, whereas in the ordinary case we often have a um, sub exponential time algorithms to solve it. So we will stick with the super singular case. Uh, and finally, uh, what is this super singular isogeny graph? It is, uh, essentially, we take uh, all the isogenous super singular elliptic curves over fp squared for a very large prime p. Uh, up to some equivalence relation, but that, that doesn't matter now. Just think of the vertices as the, as the super singular elliptic curves. And uh, the edges will be the isogenies between these curves, the functions between them. And this graph has a, a very nice property. It's called a Ramanujan graph, uh, which essentially means it has uh, lots, of, uh, lots of edges between the vertices. It has lots of connectivity, and it is uh, easy to start from one point, from one vertex in the graph, and uh, reach any other point in a very, in very few steps. Uh, so we now have uh, all, the, of the, all the elements we need to build our identification protocol. Uh, just to, to recall the very informal definition of what an identification protocol is, you might have seen this as a sigma protocol or zero knowledge, proof of knowledge. Um, essentially we have the two parties, as before, Peggy and Big, and they will interact in a certain way. Uh, 
and Peggy will want to prove uh, to Vic that she knows the secret without revealing the secret. So we want uh, three properties from this. Uh, we want completeness. If she knows the secret, she should be able to convince Vic. Uh, what we call soundness, which is uh, if she doesn't know the secret, she shouldn't be able to cheat, she shouldn't be able to produce uh, a valid proof. And finally, uh, zero knowledge property, which, she, which means that uh, this interaction reveals nothing about the secret itself. So we have this, uh, with this structure, we have it here again, uh, but now we can give a meaning to, to any of the elements here. Now we have two isogenous elliptic curves, E0 e and E1, and the secret isogeny between them. And uh, the structure of the, of the protocol will be to either given a challenge 0 or 1, reveal this vertical isogeny, or this isogeny from E0 to E2. So this looks very simple, but it's not as simple as in the, um, as in the graphism morphism case, because there, the only thing we had to do to compute this isogeny, this, well, the isomorphism in that case, uh, was to um, take the, the composition of these two. Now we can't do that. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, isogenies are not the same as isomorphisms. If we do that, uh, an attacker could, uh, try to could actually factor this, uh, this isogeny into each step, each step in the graph, and actually recover this, uh, this first part of the path, which is the secret. So if we do this, we cannot expect to have the zero knowledge property. So how do we solve this? Uh, there's a, an algorithm that we can build, and it is based on an algorithm for a related problem. It was published a few years ago by Coyle, Lauter, Petit, and Tignol. And essentially what it does is it allows us to take this isogeny we have from E0 to E2 and uh, compute another one that is, uh, that is independent on the path we took before. So it's essentially, a, in a sense, a re-randomization of this path. So what we do now is when the bit is 1, we want, we want to answer with uh, an isogeny from E0 to E2. So first we take the, the composition of these two, but we don't reveal it. Uh, we just apply to it this, uh, this new path algorithm and compute the, this re-randomized path between E0 and E2, and this is the one we revealed. And in this way, we're solving uh, the zero-knowledge problem we had before. Uh, and also, uh, well, um, I want to give you now an intuition of uh, the security of this. Uh, obviously, soundness is uh, essentially the same as in the graph isomorphism case. It's the same idea. And for zero knowledge, uh, zero knowledge is usually formalized as a um, simulation of the, of the transcripts. Essentially, we want to prove that we can uh, produce transcripts which are indistinguishable from the uh, from uh, genuine transcripts, uh, but we can produce them without knowing the secret. So let's see how we do that. We have uh, two curves, E0 and E1. We don't know the isogeny, which was the secret. Uh, so we start by taking a bit, and if it's zero, we reveal the vertical isogeny, and we do that by just taking a random walk from E1, uh, producing E2. And, sorry. Uh, and revealing the, the path. And for the other case, we just take the random walk from E0 to E2. And uh, we, we could uh, reveal this isogeny, but uh, it wouldn't have the same distribution because this very randomization algorithm that I mentioned. Uh, doesn't give you an uniformly random uh, isogeny from E0 to E2. So what we do here is uh, apply the same trick. We re-randomize here too, and we get uh, IM isogeny. Am I doing that? Um, and we get uh, an, an isogeny which has the correct distribution between E0 and E2. And finally, very briefly, uh, how to get signatures from this. Uh, so as I mentioned before, there's a, there are standard transformations. Uh, so classically, we have the Shamir transformation, which is essentially uh, replacing the, the challenges by, uh, by a hash function of the, the commitments, the curves E2, and the, and the message we want to sign. So what is happening is that Peggy is doing the, the protocol by herself, and then when Biggs wants to, to verify the signature, all he has to do is recompute the hash and verify that the, the, the proof is consistent. Uh, so this is proven to be secure in the random oracle model. 
but uh, this, when we are thinking about in, in terms of uh, quantum security, post-quantum security, uh, Fiat Shamir is not known to be secure, uh, so we replace it by another transformation uh, due to UNRU, uh, which is uh, proven to be secure in the quantum random oracle model. Um, so this, uh, this UNRU transformation uh, is in some way similar to Fiat Shamir, it's more complicated, but uh, it's the same idea of using some hash functions to replace the verifier. Uh, so to summarize what we did, we start with isogenic problems, which we believe are a, a good candidate for post-quantum security. We build an identification scheme based on the pure isogenic problem uh, in contraposition to the previous scheme, which was based on a potentially weaker problem. Uh, a key to do this was uh, this randomization algorithm. That was a key step of, of our proof. And finally, we can derive signatures in a standard way using generic transformations. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much. I think we have time for questions. Yes. Now, Ali? Yeah, fine. Uh, can you provide some numbers, uh, key sizes, uh, signature sizes, if uh, you implement it in a secure way? Um, actually, well, I can provide the, the, the concrete numbers right now. I don't have any, uh, but I can say this is not very efficient. <laughs> uh, if you want, I can give you some numbers later, but I don't have any here. Other questions? Yeah, there's a question in the back, but I think, um, yes. So, so I'm wondering about uh, how, how it compares. So you were talking about previous uh, signature schemes based on isogenies mm -hmm. um, that were based on more specific problems than the one that you are considering. Uh, but then if you take uh, the security parameter into to account and, and the difference in efficiency, do those problems become incomparable? Or can you say that you have a more solid problem even regardless of that? Uh, so I believe the previous scheme is uh, slightly more efficient than ours. Uh, but, uh, but there's this problem of uh, the problem being potentially weaker. I mean, there's, uh, it's not that there's an algorithm that solves the other problem uh, faster in general, but there are some cases in which this additional information that is given can be exploited to reduce some attacks. Okay, if you have a question, then you have to see either the speaker or me, otherwise. <laughs> I don't see anyone else anymore. Okay, so we thank everybody else uh, again for the questions and uh, authors, of course, uh, for, for the paper. <laughs> <laughs>